Good morning, everybody. So, um, Mike and I are going to uh, reflect together. Um, we have prepared this, so it's not a completely free-range reflection. Um, <laughs> you said you were. Well oiled. Well uh, on uh, our uh, pilgrimage. Um, and just to draw out some themes that emerged from uh, the conversations and encounters we've had. So uh, I'm going to start by a little introduction just to remind you what we've done or tell you if you haven't uh, been aware of it. Then uh, Mike's going to say something, I may chip in. I'm going to say something, he may chip in. We'll do that until um, Sharon tells us to stop. <laughs> Can I start though by saying thank you to uh, Tony Orwood and Susan Lowry, uh, without whom this would not have happened. Uh, they have since uh, September or even earlier been engaged in planning this for us in the finest detail. Uh, so each day we would set off with a little booklet where Tony had walked the route sometime in the summer and taking little pictures telling us, go down this footpath, make this turning here. So uh, there was uh, at least reduced the chance of us getting lost. Um, uh, slightly confusing because Tony had taken pictures in the summer, we were walking in the winter. What was a, a fr thriving bush was now a few sticks. Um, but uh, really, really grateful to Tony and Susan for their hard, and really hard work and, and constant engagement with this. So we spent 10 days. We started on Ash Wednesday with the Eucharist and ashing uh, on a very blustery uh, uh, Southwall Pier. We actually ended up going into the restaurant on the pier to have the service there for um, something over 70 people who gathered with us. And blustery was a theme that ran through uh, the 10 days for us. We finished last night with evening prayer in Stowe Market Church, and we covered, uh, if we'd walked all of it, it would have been 94 miles. Um, but in fact, uh, on Tuesday afternoon, the rain was so heavy that we were drowned in within a couple of minutes. We were walking through, um, where were we? Uh, Mellis, near Mellis. Uh, and we, uh, we were grateful for lifts then to our... Uh, subsequent stops for that afternoon and that took about four miles off the total. So we've been through Beckles and Bungie and Hoxon and Walsham and Ixworth and Bacton and lots of places in between. We've been to uh, something around, Mike and I disagree on the number, there is a precise number, but something around 30 churches. We've walked with people, um, been accompanied on all of the journey with I think one exception, there was one period when it was just uh, uh, you and me. Um, kind of ran out of things to talk about, so. <laughs> um, and and we've, we've been to businesses, we've been to schools, uh, we've been to community projects, we've, we've been uh, engaged in conversations along the way with farmers, with business leaders, with church leaders, with um, people from local communities who just wanted to step up and talk. Uh, I have been overwhelmed again by the beauty of the Suffolk countryside and by the beauty of the people and deep sense of being in the presence of God for the whole 10 days. It was a great uh, source of gratitude and encouragement for us and uh, a real sense of people's um, uh, sense of reality, uh, which we'll talk about, and, uh, uh, and readiness and welcome, um, which we experienced uh, everywhere we went. Great uh, hospitality which characterised um, the people of all the villages and churches and communities we encountered. Mike. Um, they say that history is written by the victors and I'm not surprised Martin has left out one or two details in his account. <laughs> There was, of course, last Wednesday night in Ixworth, a uh, dance competition between the Sea of Dunwich and the Sea of St. Edmund's <laughs> Freedom. I'll leave it to you to decide who won that, given the summary of her and Martin. <laughs> I had to encourage him. <laughs> Let them win. There was also, 
also great to have uh, Bishop Darlington with us on that occasion, who was learning dance for the first time. <laughs> an excellent, excellent proponent of the sport. Whether he's taken it back to Kagira, I'm not sure. Maybe an arrested at the airport for dance. <laughs> <laughs> I sincerely hope not. Um, but I was asked um, an interesting question. If there was one picture, one vivid picture, uh, that you take from the pilgrimage, what would it be? And I was embarrassed to say that, uh, that it's true, probably, a very, very large sponge cake at Mellis, <laughs> <laughs> which was absolutely phenomenal. And whoever cooked that, Julia Lall isn't here, is she, because she's on sabbatical. But it was amazing. But it was partly the hospitality that we received on the way that was wonderful. Um, and you will know that if you followed us on Facebook, and there have been one or two acerbic comments that has to be said on Facebook, suggesting our Lenten discipline is not all it should be. <laughs> <laughs> it would, however, have been rude at Wickham Vineyard to refuse the champagne. <laughs> And I remain robust in Martin's defence. <laughs> now, what was I going to say? Um, none of that. None of that. Um, so, um, God is simple. God is simple. Um, the doctrine of God's simplicity uh, means that there are no parts to God. It's not that God is love over here, and goodness over here, and mercy over here, and the parts don't meet. If God is love, God is completely love. God is simply love. God is simply uh, forgiving. God is simply merciful. And God is simply good. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that concludes for me well, one concludes from that, if, if God is good and God creates our creation, then where we see God's goodness, presumably there is something of God at work who is goodness personified. And it was a reminder, I guess, the pilgrimage partly, to see um, in that, that phrase, God is at work, that we use so easily, just where that goodness was being participated and shared. Uh, by those from a wide variety of backgrounds and a wide variety of under self-understandings. Some of it more obvious than elsewhere, such as uh, Thornham Walks and the Street Forge, where they were enabling people with mental health difficulties to undertake craft activities and, and be part of and contribute to uh, a business. And others where it was slightly <coughs> less obvious, such as uh, Moncton's Malting Factory, for instance, with their um, passionate concern uh, for being the very best environment, <coughs> as well as in terms of uh, the ingredients they offered for a healthy lifestyle. So when we say <coughs> in our uh, Dyson strategy, God is with us, uh, there's a danger that by us we mean <coughs> us here. Yeah, and just us in the church. But remember John 3.16, God so loved the world, God so loved the world, that he sent his only son. So the church is part of the world, but we cannot collapse the world into the church. And part of our encouragement should be how much God is already at work in this world of ours, in the goodness we see around us. And that was certainly part of the encouragement we took um, from our pilgrimage. Not only so, but um, I think the hospitality to the church, as embodied, for instance, by the way in which businesses and schools and other organisations welcomed and embraced us, suggests that uh, certainly in Suffolk there is a place for an organisation explicitly naming and worshipping this God of goodness. And we were greatly encouraged by that. And indeed, the hospitality of particular local churches, which was, I think, uniformly very warm. So, Martin, what else do you have to say? Mike's just uh, <coughs> reflected on the uh, participating in uh, the work of God in the world and, and a whole range of people. Um, whatever they describe themselves at in, ter in terms of faith, uh, sharing in that work. Um, I wanted to say something about our reflections on 
uh, congregations as we observed uh, as we went through and, and listening to people tell their stories. So on the one hand, we saw uh, a huge amount to encourage us. There were thriving congregations, flourishing congregations, in a whole host of different places as we went through. And this wasn't just the kind of bishop effect, um, <laughs> people turning up, but it was stories people told about themselves. Uh, stories they told about how new families were joining them. Stories they told about their engagement in their community. And a real sense of vitality and strength there. Um, so greatly encouraged by that. Um, but there, on the other hand, there, was, there were stories from people who were saying, actually, we, we, there's only two of us, we can't carry on. And a, and a sense of uh, reaching uh, that in a, in a good way, in a healthy way, uh, albeit a sad way, that position where they recognize that uh, we need to do things differently. And I think that mixture of the positive and encouraging and the sense of realism that says, if, if we are going to c flourish and continue and thrive in these ways, we need perhaps to stop focusing our energies in these ways. That was a, a refrain that ran throughout uh, for us in, in, and we encountered in various uh, places. Um, we were struck, Mike's already indicated this, by the way in which the church was uh, by and large engaged in every community. Um, in the communities of which they are a part. Uh, there were places where there was a sense that the church was less engaged. The, 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 the challenge uh, that people uh, said to us on various occasions was the issues about new people moving in who were not only not engaged with the church but they weren't engaged with the community. And that actually the, the church and the indigenous community, if you like, were working well together, but the newcomers weren't joining in that. And that's a, that's a real challenge as one looks further uh, down the track. The, um, I want to say just something also about teams. Uh, what also struck us was that uh, the way in which teams of clergy and laity working together uh, and where they were intentionally working as teams, where there was an awareness of, of uh, working to develop how they work together as teams. That was a, a hallmark of those places where things seemed to be working well, where there was a real recognition of the different contributions that clergy and laity made. And there, there wasn't so much of a, as it were, a hierarchical model, but a real sense of people sharing together in a, a, a shared enterprise, where clergy, and I, this, it was fascinating listening to clergy in these contexts, I say to them, so, so how would you describe your role? And they'd say, well, it's about being an enabler, an encourager, one to support people in developing, identifying and developing their gifts which is absolutely key, and we saw that uh, uh, through uh, many of the places we went through where that was happening. A great sign of, of, of life together, of sharing in the gospel together, and in <coughs> enabling, uh, trying some new things. Uh, patterns of worship that are new and, uh, and reaching out to new people. Uh, patterns of worship that may look like hospitality, first of all, and not necessarily worship and yet was ga were gathering people together to share in some way or other in the uh, experience of the faith. So, um, <clears throat> there's a frightening statistic that I don't quite uh, remember accurately, but it says something like 80% um, uh, of people if they become Christian <coughs> adults, but within five years they no longer have any friends outside of the church uh, because church has become all absorbing and insulating from the world around them. Um, and I say that's frightening, obviously there's some good aspects to that in terms of brothers and sisters in Christ, but it does mean that our witness, that our engagement is going to be somewhat limited if it becomes inward looking. So there's something about what
what we're, we're trying to do with our pilgrimage is to, to, to model what, what we seek, which is this engagement with the world around us. Um, and this clues into what we're endeavouring to do with the Strategic Development Fund that we'll hear about later, with the Fresh Expressions Agenda, which is how we uh, enable church to be accessible to the missing generations and that demography that we're not touching. What is it to be outward facing and engaging in that way? So part of the point of our pilgrimage was to do that. And it's also very important that we did that together. Um, in the Philippians passage, it's very easy in our individualistic age to assume Paul is addressing individuals that somehow lump together. But Paul, most of the time, is addressing congregations. So when Paul says to lead your life in a man worthy of Christ, he is chastening <laughs> a group of people to do so in terms of their relationships with one another. So what is it for us, for myself and Martin, to model something of that and to model our engagement with the world in ways which are, are encouraging and enabling of others to do so? Just, uh, just pick up on that. Uh, one of the things that struck us was uh, the schools we engaged with where uh, these are church schools. I think were they all church schools? Yeah, yeah. And a real sense that the, the, the youngsters were learning about the faith in a way, I think, and to an extent that a generation ago probably wasn't happening. Um, there has been a huge improvement in how that does take place. And it, their parents may not know about the faith and those children, in some way or other, become evangelists to their parents. Uh, so that was, a, that was a striking theme for us. Of course, we know about it, but listening to children talk about it uh, makes that uh, real. Um, the, the other dimension of this was, uh, <clears throat> picking up on what Mike has just said, the other dimension of this is there is a danger, I say this very carefully, there is a danger if we focus on dis only on discipleship. Um, because what we then, we, the danger is that we become a sect and we only talk to ourselves, um, which is Mike's point. A and what we need to be able to do, I think, is to see discipleship as the bearers of the story, hence the, the remark about the children, the learners and bearers and sharers of the story, enabling all sorts of people to participate in a variety of different ways that keeps those, if you like, those boundaries very blurred so that the community and, and working for the common good is something which the church is a catalyst and participant in, uh, enabling, but with enabling so that as many people as possible are touched by that. So I think that there's a, there's a, 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 a question there that I came away with about you know, what enables a good integration between church and community work in a community. Um, my brief at this point was to talk about buildings, though. And um, so I learned about scratch dials. I didn't know about scratch dials before this. I've now seen probably, I think, uh, six or seven scratch dials. You know, these on, on, a, a, on a stone, on a... Um, Buttress, that will do, thank you. Um, <laughs> word that springs to mind. Um, on a bu buttress, a, a, a little uh, a sort of spoked pattern cut, scratched into the stone with a, a dent in the middle, and the priest would put his um, stick or stylus or something in there, cast a shadow, and would work out what time the service would start. And, <laughs> So I saw plenty of those. We saw, I think, six um, Norman Round Towers. Uh, we saw Saxon and Norman Round Towers. We saw um, a similar or greater number of Norman arches as we walked along. So the, the, the wonderful beauty of our church buildings. I learned about flush work, which I didn't know about before. How do we make this treasure sustainable? And the, the, the stark relief for me was expressed by two people in a gorgeous little church in a village, village is the wrong word, a hamlet of 30 people. And where those 30 people were not necessarily engaged in supporting that church or caring for the building. 
compared with, for instance, here, um, and I only pick here because we're standing here, where there's a popula population of 18,000 and one building. And so you've got a huge discrepancy between the, the load, the number of people, the resources, the potential resources in attending to a building, um, uh, let alone attending to the mission, but attending to the building as, a, as an ingredient in that mission. Um, huge discrepancies between different sorts of communities. And we need, and um, the, the building group that's working on these issues will hopefully be coming up with some recommendations about how we tackle that in a way that <coughs> releases more energy for mission, but ensures also that our buildings are properly cared for. Um, but not necessarily having services or services all the time. Um, so working that out is, is going to be, is a challenge for us, uh, but a good challenge for us. And I'm glad, I was glad to hear as we went around, people's readiness to face up to those realities <coughs> and to make some of the decisions that need to be made. I think you have the last word. Do I? <coughs> okay, our time runs out. I may interrupt. You may interrupt. <coughs> um, I learned one or two things about the difference between a diocesan and a suffragan. <laughs> Some of which I can share. <laughs> Such as, um, a suffragan doesn't get his ear bent in the way that a diocesan gets his ear bent. Though I have to say, I don't think either of us got our ear bent too much. No, no, no. No. Just one or two locations, which for a fee of money, for Kagira Land Fund, we will be you. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, and, yeah, just a word of thanks, really, for those who made my birthday very special, which was uh, en route. Uh, thank you very much. You know who you are. And it was delightful to spend my Two day birthday before. cakes. <laughs> it was three, actually. I just didn't share the third. <laughs> I, I say, uh, after the last two uh, of these pilgrimage, and I say this again, that I, I will live off this experience. It's an intense experience for 10 days, intense experience of conversation, taking things in, walking, set, feeling a place, feeling your way into a place in a way that you don't when you drive in and drive out. Um, so a, 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 a real richness that uh, we will live off for the rest of the year. And uh, we will have opportunities to share with some more depth some of the uh, experiences we had and the insights that came, and therefore how we do our work. I have to say, um, I would happily find ways in which we engaged, in terms of our roles as bishops, engaged with being bishops in this way throughout the year, rather than some of the other things we find ourselves doing. Um, so. Uh, wonderfully encouraging, a wonderful experience of the presence of God at work, alive, active, uh, with a host of people inside and outside the church. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Martin. And Mike,